faced as we are with global environmental deterioration, I wish to address every person living on this planet. In this encyclical, I would like to enter into dialogue with all people about our common home. Water is the blood of the earth. And water is in our language. The Mutsu language is Rama. It's the creek that contains the water. It's the movement of the water. It's the sound of the water. They are one and inseparable. Water is the blood of the earth. All the water on this planet is all the water that we have. And if we fill it with toxic fluids, if we use it in a way that it can never be used again, then we have deprived God's creation of this water, and we've deprived ourselves of this wonderful gift of the sacrament. Blessed is the transformative power of the universe for creating this incredible universe and blessing us with the possibility of human life and all of the joys that come from living on this planet and recognize the beauty of this world and do everything we can to preserve and protect it. Amen. The Pope has given us a wonderful gift in this encyclical. We can see within his words the values that all people of faith can share of caring for God's creation. This is the time when all of us are being called to create a perfect world. We are all called in conscience to look to our higher self, our God image, and see the responsibility that we have. Pope Francis says that care for creation is not a domain of a, of a few people, you know, those people in the environmental movement, let them take care of it. No, <laughs> it's our responsibility because it is our common home. And all those in, in this country have the moral responsibility to get involved. The planet is a gift to us and preserving it is a sacred issue because we're the stewards of what we have, our resources. And uh, if we don't preserve it, our children, their children, won't have the same beauty around them that we have. Stewardship, I believe, is our first calling when it comes to Western Christian thought and the biblical record God calls us to first be stewards, caretakers of the earth. We have a special obligation to protect and care for this world. And at this moment, for the first time in human history, human power has gotten to the point where we can actually destroy the life support system of this planet. And we seem to be moving there in a very accelerated way. Over the course of the past 150 years, we've done incredible damage to this planet. When we trash God's creation, when we pollute, waters, poison, our atmosphere, condemned to death, future generations. It's a direct insult to God. Already we're seeing the effects of climate change. It's not like it's off there in the future. It's already here. We see it in California in the, in the form of a serious drought that's been going on for several years. And fracking is just one more example. You know, you didn't hear about fracking a few years ago, but fracking is the most recent and egregious practices because, you know, literally it means fracturing the earth. So it's like we're, you know, the 
companies who want to do this are shaking the earth or stringing it out, trying to get the last possible drops of oil or gas, um, particles of gas out of it. You know, shaking Mother Earth and saying, we want everything we can get out of you. This is what is unethical. You know, there are things that we're doing for money that we know is wrong. The Bible says, treat others as you would want to be treated, right, when it comes down to it, right? So why would you allow something negative to happen on one side of town that you wouldn't allow to happen in your backyard? If it's not good for you, then, of course, it's not good for others. Every human being has a, a fundamental intuition about what is right and what is wrong. And those intuitions are almost universally shared. The core intuition is that we have an obligation to care for ourselves and care for each other. We have parts of the earth that privileged people live in that don't show the fractures of pollution and contaminated groundwater as much as other communities and often poorer communities where, you know, the drilling and the fracking and all of the other things to, that abuse our resources take place. It's important that those of us who live in a beautiful place, that we are mindful that there are places that we've made ugly. Fracking, acidation, and unconventional oil drilling has certainly caused a lot of anxiety and insecurity for a lot of the members of our congregation. They are dealing with challenges from infrastructure damage. They are dealing with health challenges. And just the sheer sense of insecurity in this community uh, as a result of what's happening right in our backyard. Considering the environmental impact of fracking, the impact that it has on climate with the release of huge quantities of uh, methane gas, even kind of small amount of methane release has huge consequences. And then on top of it, there is an issue of the water, you know, the precious water that is being contaminated and presents a serious problem to our soil, impact on agriculture as well. So when we take into consideration this heavy environmental impact, we realize that fracking is not the solution. It's a big problem. In the case of Chapter, children are playing 150 yards away from an oil pump that had been fracked. While the drilling operations were happening, the smell that was coming while the drilling was happening was so bad that teachers decided that the children were not coming out to play anymore on the playground and that they will do every physical activity indoors, in the gym, even inside of the classroom. There was actually three days that the children were not able to go outside. They spent the whole school day inside of the classroom. No children should be forced into not be able to enjoy a playground or to enjoy doing any sort of sports because there's an industry so close to them that is putting a lot of money in their pockets without giving any benefits to these children. I think that we have to begin to think more about what pollution does and in the future when it comes to energy and how we gain energy. What is the cost to quote unquote uh, a low energy bill? A lot of times we say well our energy bills are low and uh, we're trying to keep it down so everybody can be able to afford this energy. The great reality is that the energy cost because as we flick on our lights for a low price, somebody in that's disproportionate is suffering uh, because of the way that the energy is produced. A world that values economics above human health is a world that we don't need because ultimately uh, it's a detriment to all of us. It's like creating our own cancer. If we don't have our health, you know, what difference does economics make? Working for short-term gains which was the money that they're getting from oil, and disregarding the long-term losses of life, of degradation of our environment, uh, pollution of our water, destroying our water sources, our water, and our agriculture. I mean, an earthquake is, is, is just common sense. And I asked the question, well, is there anything you know, going on, pollution, anything? Uh, in the area. And then one pastor said, well, no, but we have been having earthquakes. 
I said, I said, I said you've been having earthquakes? I said, why, why are you having earthquakes? I said, yeah, Pastor, we, we have more earthquakes here than you guys have in California. I said, oh. I said, well, why are you having earthquakes, you think? And then someone said, well, they're fracking and the oil companies here, right? And because of the fracking, now we have earthquakes. That's a problem. And that's something that has to be fought. We gathering at the intersection, at the intersection of exploitation, the intersection where a lot of deception is taking place, the intersection where a lot of destruction is taking place. And at this intersection, we come together to facilitate the justice uh, that is due to all of us as a community, as communities, but also the justice that is due the environment and the earth and all uh, who we call our brothers and our sisters. The fight against striking is not only about low-income communities and communities of color, but communities of faith. So what they're trying to tell us and the message that they're trying to send is, if you have faith, you shouldn't care about the environment that you live in. If you have faith, you should be submissive and just let the will of God happen in your community. Reality is that if we have faith, we have to stand up for our faith and we cannot let anyone come and crush us. I think what we have to take care of is the quality of life. Everyone, whether you're a Christian, a Muslim, a Jew, a Buddhist, all of us have to come together and to finally pay attention to the world that was given to us to take care of and to make a single line and say this is what we're doing for the environment. There is often a disconnect between social change movements and people's spiritual life for a sad reason that many social change movements don't articulate their connection to any spiritual vision. And many spiritual people feel that they don't want any politics in their spiritual practice. I think it's very important to overcome that division and to encourage people to bring their spirituality into the public space one of the greatest challenges that we face is what Pope Francis described as terror pessimism, that somehow we cannot do anything about climate crises or we cannot muster enough kind of energy, resources to come to stand up to the big polluters. No, <laughs> there is a lot of things that we can, that we can do. Our, our religious tradition are uh, full of stories of of transformation, of empowerment, of how God has empowered ordinary people to do extraordinary deeds and actions. Leadership looks like people who take climate change serious, people who are willing to, such as myself as a pastor and members of my congregation, to say that this is wrong and run the risk that you're gonna alienate some people. I think too often leaders are not responsible they're not proactive because they are afraid of retribution, they're afraid of what uh, the peers are going to say or what the parishioners are going to say or what their constituents are going to say. So I think moral people learn to stand on their own teeth. They, they learn to have a higher calling, one that's not based on what other people are saying. We want to make sure that the faith communities got the message and that the faith communities did what only the faith communities can do. That, that we not be behind in the conversation, but that our pastors, our gospel artists, uh, individuals who have influence uh, ought to be just as excited, just as motivated to fight the polluters, uh, to fight individuals that are negatively affecting the planet, uh, and that we ought to do that because it is our moral charge, you know, that the Bible charges us to be fruitful and multiply, yes, but also to be stewards of God's earth. And so I think this is the story, and no matter if it's Christian or Muslim, all of our religious books point to this thing of creation care. You need, in a sense, you need a grounding, and the faith traditions that all support the sacredness of life and resources in this planet as a whole. Those voices, if they were joined, could be very powerful, very powerful. And people will listen. I think the politicians will have to listen. Money may help their campaigns, but we elect them. 
Unless citizens control political power, it will not be possible to control damage done to the environment. Extremely important decisions are being made about the well-being of life support system of our planet, the future of our children and the next generations, based on the narrow interest of a privileged few. The current system is wreaking havoc upon Earth's ecosystems, that um, our common home is being pillaged, and cowardice in defending it is a grave sin. The Bible says be angry, but sin not. We have to know even as Christians when it's time to fight. And this is something that, that ought to be fought. Another part of this is that we have to think in terms of environmental justice, bigger picture. And where there's fracking, work very hard to get it to stop. Some people wonder what fracking has to do with people of faith. And I always explain to them that sadly fracking is sort of the perfect storm where you see this combination of corporate interests and um, fossil fuel extraction, environmental degradation, complete disengagement from what community means, and the violation of rights of individuals and families. So it's really important that we stand alongside and give voice to those who are suffering from extreme fossil fuel extraction. We all hear the conversation and the argument about being energy independent. Everything starts right there. Well, energy independent doesn't mean giving all this power to the oil industry to do whatever the heck they want with our communities. If they really want to be energy independent, they should be focusing on renewable energy, green energy, energy that is not only going to benefit the pockets of the industry, but that is going to benefit the health of our community members. I keep seeing in my mind my grandchildren, and uh, I think, what are they going to inherit if, we don't, if we're not stewards now of this planet, responsible stewards, taking every step we can take, then what is the planet going to look like for them? New York has just banned fracking as, as a result of noticing health impacts on people. You know, when kids can't play in a playground for three days after a fracking process because there's, there are chemicals in the air, something is not right with that picture. We need to put pressure where it's appropriate, whether it's on the elected leaders or the government departments that are responsible for studying these issues to actually take a good look and see what the health impacts are and ban fracking as they did in New York. Now, it is a moment for us. You know, God believes in us that in this kind of ugliness of so much of what's happening kind of in the world, that uh, you and I, everyone, can live up to God's kind of expectations and can become artisans of beauty to create kind of a, civil, a new civilization of love. What I see here is an opportunity for us to build something that is healthy and sustainable so that our children can look back and say, yes, they inherited a very difficult situation, but they did everything they could to try to clean up the mess and to make things better for us. I don't want them to look back and ask me, what did you do? I want to be able to say to them, honey, I did everything I could. And here's what we did. And I want you to carry on this work. This is the great work of our time.